In this video, part one of a two part series, we take a look at sensors. Sensors are input devices. They come in many different shapes and sizes, but they are essentially all measuring the physical properties of their environment and translating those signals into digital information a computer can use. So we live in an analog world. All of our perceptions from sound to touch and sight can be measured on a continuous sinuating line. Take this simple example of turning a light on and off again. To us, it might appear that the light immediately changes from one state to another. If we could slow time down, however, we would notice a gradual increase of light followed by a gradual decrease, which can be represented by the curved line. Digital systems, such as computing devices, don't operate like this. In our digital representation, this light exists in one of two binary states, either on or off, and it switches instantly between them, as shown here. As real data is analog in nature, it's constantly changing, and it does not have a single discrete set of values. Consider this mercury thermometer. We simply look at the scale and use our best judgment to read off a temperature. In the analog world, there exists an infinite number of values for this reading. It simply depends on how accurately the thermometer is able to be read. In order to make sense of real world quantities, all sensors need to convert the information they're collecting into a digital format. Now, this is typically achieved by some form of analog to digital converter or ADC. And these devices convert real world values into discrete digital values. So before we look at sensors in more detail, let's just consider two main situations here, where we're using sensors for monitoring and when we use them for control. So the process starts off the same with the yellow boxes. Sensors record and send signals to a microprocessor or a computer. Those signals are converted, if necessary, by an analog to digital converter. And then the microprocessor or computing device analyzes the data by checking the values it's received against values it has stored. Now, this is where we differ. If we go down the orange route, we can consider that if the values that have been collected are outside an acceptable range, then we need to produce some kind of warning. This could be sent to a screen or an audio alarm could go off, for example. The actual computer or microprocessor monitoring these values has actually no effect on what is being monitored by the sensor. This is purely having a monitoring effect only. Now, if we go down the red route and do the same thing, so here we're gonna say the values are outside the acceptable range, but this time we send some kind of control signal to say operate a valve or an accurate actuator connected to a motor. So this change, this output, actually now affects the following set of input values received from the sensor. And we call this a feedback loop. So we can see a nice practical example of this feedback loop and the input and output sensor cycle. And in this example, we're considering a smart braking system for cars. So we start on the top right with a sensor taking constant readings of the distance of objects ahead of it. These analog real world values get converted into a format a microprocessor can understand using an analog to digital converter. The microprocessor then takes this input and calculates the speed the car is traveling and safe braking distances. And if it detects the car is traveling too fast and a collision is likely, it issues commands to brake. These digital signals get converted into an analog form, which can be applied to an appropriate motor, which will apply the brake pads. And this is done in the reverse by digital to analog converter. And then finally, the actuator applies the brake pad slowing the car down. 
The sensor, meanwhile, is continuing to constantly send out values, and those values will have now changed due to the action of the car braking. And again, this is known as feedback. So sensors can be designed to detect a wide variety of levels and different conditions. On the screen now are the 14 sensors that you're required to know about for your exam. We're going to go through these in more detail than might be used in part two. For now, pause the video and take some notes on what you've learned so far. Thank you.